Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India This slide is very informative because in this uh, slide we have only one term, but this term is defined differently by different scholars. For example, Keys flourishing is different, Hoofert and So flourishing is different, Diener et al flourishing is different, Seligman et al flourishing is different. However, some of these factors are common in different theories. On the other hand, some other factors are unique in these theories. So, when we assess someone's flourishing level, then a reader must understand with which perspective it is, because your theory would be connected with psychological test items or questions. And then this theory oriented items or questions in a psychological test will be asked and on the basis of this you will be having your score. So, it means when we are studying research papers based on flourishing, first of all or first topmost point here is what is operational definition of happiness, what is operational definition of flourishing. So, this operational definition is highly connected with the, with the psychological test items and then only you can say the composition of this flourishing is by these, these, these factors. So, that is why different psychological tests may have different level of flourishing by of different people. So, that is why when we are reading research papers, we should know what is the definition of flourishing or, or happiness or well-being or mental health. So, that is very important for us because there is different scholars addressing it differently. Now, some more theories. Kohn in 1991 included western as well as some eastern psychological concepts. We eastern psychological concepts as you know which I covered in initial chapters in which we are saying that these are more religion focused Hinduism, Buddhism etcetera. So, uh, by combining eastern as well as western concepts he has proposed his theory of well being. And in his theory, he is saying there are five main factors. First is efficiency. This refers to an exceptional use of one's talent skills. People who pursue excellence in specific endeavors such as sports or a professional are focused on this mode of fulfillment. Second is creativity. Again, you could easily understand that is unique one here. So, individuals who have an artistic temperament choose this mode of fulfillment. So, these two factors saying that if you are in mode of fulfillment and fulfill, fulfilling those modes, then you are happy in your life. And relatedness like other scholars in which they are saying positive emotions or relatedness very important factor, here the focus is on the development of interpersonal relationships and the presence of love. So, that is common in even previous theories. However, along with these three factors, he has borrowed two specifically from Asian or Eastern cultures that is self transcendence and inner harmony. With Asian model, we will discuss about inner harmony. In this mode, the focus is on psychological criteria such as personality integration and the search for one's true self. On the other hand, self transcendence, the focus of uh, this mode is on a person's relationship to God, spirit or the ultimate ground of being. It means when we have connection with ultimate life or something which is not observable like spirit, soul, God etcetera. So, by combining all these 
five factors he proposed well-being theory. However, he said that we may have high score on some of them and low score on other uh, factors and here he also focused that there is no need to combine all these five factor scores. That is very important for us because in Carroll Reef model, in Seligman model, in Desi and Reins model, sometime even we have additive score and uh, we say total well-being score. So, if we compare all these models here, some factors are quite common with each other and to some extent definitions are also connected with each other. On the other hand, other factors are quite unique factors. For example, positive relationship, almost all scholars have highlighted role of positive relationship in terms of positive relationships or relatedness, whether it is uh, say psychological well-being, PERMA model or uh, need model or Cohen model. So, all of them giving importance to social relations or positive relationship very much. Second one is environmental mastery, accomplishment, competence and efficiency. This is also to some extent connected with each other. Purpose in life, meaning, self-transcendence. Uh, can be connected with each other. Autonomy has been highlighted by psychological well-being model as well as by Desi and Ryan's model. Uh, personal growth, inner harmony to some extent can share to some extent percentage of variance when we define. On the other hand, self-acceptance, positive emotion, engagement, creativity are to some extent independent variables which are in different different theories. When we cross the border and go ahead and see how well-being has been addressed by other scholars, not hardcore positive psychologists or psychology scholars, then they are actually taking into account other areas also. For example, dimensions of well-being as per World Health Organization is a state of well-being in which the individual realizes his or her own abilities, can cope with the normal stresses of life can work uh, productively and fruitfully and is able to make a contribution to his or her community. Let us understand these factors one, once again. They are saying that realizes his or her own abilities. So, if you know what are your abilities and how can use your abilities. Second is can cope up with the normal stresses of life. We know we confront with various stresses in our day to day life. Are we able to cope up? That is also dimension of well being. Can work productively and fruitfully. Are we able to contribute to our life uh, by doing some work productively and fruitfully? And the last one is able to make a contribution to his or her community. Are we able to? contribute to our society, to our community. So, these are the factors or these are the variables which decide our level of well-being. Similarly, some scholars are taking different domains to define well-being like physical, emotional, social, environment, or occupational, intellectual, spiritual etcetera. So, you can easily understand that psychology scholars focusing more on psychological factors. On the other hand, other domain people are taking into account different domains to define wellness or well-being like social, environmental, occupational, emotional, intellectual, physical, spiritual etcetera. So, that is why in gross national happiness domains, psychological well-being and health are the only two domains. Along with these domains, there are various other domains which are highlighted, which are you know uh, taking into account to have gross national level of happiness. For example, this is one example in which they are saying there are various uh, domains which will define our happiness like living standards, assets, housing, household per capita, income. These are the main factors to have high level of happiness. Ecological diversity and resilience in which we are talking about ecological issues, responsibility towards environment, 
wildlife damage uh, especially in rural areas, urbanization issues. So, these are the issues which are contributing to the well being or happiness when we are talking about national happiness. Community vitality in which donation, time and money, you know relationship, family, safety, these factors are also important. Good governance, government performance, fundamental rights, service, political participation, such kind of factors are taking into account. Cultural diversity and resilience in which you know speak native language, cultural participation, artistic skills, these are important for education. Literacy, schooling, knowledge values are very important. Time use, work and sleep are these balanced that is important for us. Along with all these factors, uh, health that is mental health, self reported health status, healthy days, disabilities and psychological well being in which they are uh, mainly focusing on emotional well being, life satisfaction, positive emotions, negative emotions also broadly that subjective well being plus spirituality. So, these are the factors which are defining gross national happiness level. That is why uh, happiness may have various factors and in different studies we may have different factors and as per those factors we may define well being of individuals, well being of uh, particular community, well being of particular society, well being of uh, nations or even sometime we have cross nations, cross societies or cultures comparisons on happiness. So, that is why we should know how this happiness or well being has been defined in the particular research. We have discussed different perspectives mainly from European and western scholars. However, these theories as well as psychological tests have been used in different cultures in India, in Asian cultures, in European as well as in western cultures. So, that is why we can say that was psychology of mainstream of psychology or even can connect it with psychology in India. Let us know what do we have in Indian psychology to define happiness. There are various models which are defining happiness here and uh, some connected one and most of them are focusing more on inner well being rather on external factors. So, first of all I have identified some of these domains or factors which are connected with happiness and let us know first these factors. However, still scope to have many more models to define happiness which are existing in our religious spiritual literature as well as uh, Indian philosophical literature. So, from this uh, storehouse I have identified some of them. Let us talk about them one by one. First one is Panch Koshas. Indian tradition recognize multi layered existence of human beings. We have the potential to evolve and move towards higher level of existence and we have uh, koshas one by one. So, our basic level or lowest layer is physical kosha and this is anme kosh. Then we gradually move to the other levels this uh, pranme kosh, then manomaya kosh, then vigyanme kosh and then to the level of uh, anandme kosh that is highest level of existence. So, I think easily you could identify all these koshas, anname kosh, food seed, pranme kosh, vital air seed, manome kosh that is mental seed and vigyanme kosh, knowledge seed and then bliss body, anandme level. So, if we go with all with these layers, so ultimate level is the anandme kosh and if we touch our anandme kosh then we have sachidanand. It is also argued that human should search for inner source of happiness that is sachidanand and this sachidanand is sat being truth, chit being aware of consciousness of and anand bliss and that is our characterization by transformation and transcendence. So, for transformation and for transcendence we should have level of Satchidanand, Sat Chit or Anandme level and it is the our ultimate level when we are Anandme. 
So, that is our first model which is describing happiness, but uh, you can easily connect here with the inner self, with the consciousness and within us it is happening. Rather, there are some external factors which are defining or determining our happiness level. The purpose of knowledge is traditional terminology, therefore, is liberation from various attachments and overcoming the various kinds of suffering and ignorance. So, they are saying that a purpose of knowledge or gaining knowledge is to get liberation or mukti from various attachments. Asakti, anasakti is another model which I will discuss later and we actually want to overcome from this suffering and ignorance or kaleshas. So, when we are able to overcome, we are able to you know reduce all these uh, sufferings, then we move towards the happiness or anandme level and ultimate goal is to get mukti from the attachments or from asakti. So, when we are liberal or mukt from all these attachments, then we are actually uh, reducing our suffering, kleshas or ignorance. And when we are moving upwards uh, towards anandamaya kosh, then it is all happening within ourself. Some scholars borrowed these terms and then they expanded understanding of Sachidanand. Like Meng Ten uh, in his book, Search Inside Yourself. He said, when the mind is calm and clear, it returns to its default state and that default state is happiness. This indicate that happiness is not something you pursue, but it is something you allow. It means and I think if you take interest in some spiritual leaders, they have been repeating it again and again. Buddhist psychology or Buddhism repeating it again and again. It is just like you know problems or uh, anxiety, tension, stress we have because we have thoughts related to anxiety, stress, tension. If we are away from all those thoughts, then we will be getting happiness once again. And that is why during meditation, during yogas or some other practices which are helping us to have higher level of happiness during those processes because we are away from the thoughts which are creating anxiety, tension, stress. That is why uh, we are away from those thoughts and that is why we are happy and healthy or getting happiness state in our mind. So, it means there are some ways where we are disturbing ourselves. If we learn how we can reduce this disturbance and how we can reduce thoughts which are creating anxiety, stress, tension or other problems, then easily we can learn how we could be happy. And I think this is a very important lesson from this uh, slide, how we can maintain our happiness level or could pursue our happiness level. So, it is just like within us and no need to search it outside. Another work by Campbell in 1988, he also focused on this, uh, he used, he borrowed these Indian, you know, religious uh, concept, Sachidanand, and he said, uh, follow your bliss. And for following your bliss, you will be getting being consciousness and blissful level, Sachidanand level. And he also identified some intra-individual clusters. In these clusters, he said positive sense of self, self determination, energy, strength of character and relationship with others and the world would uh, create that level of or through this process or through by having these positive traits in our personality, we may follow our bliss or may have level of anandme, sachidanand. Next factor is gunas and well-being. I think you must be knowing about Sat guna, Rajas and Tamas guna. These three gunas are related with or associated with well-being. That is why I think we should uh, discuss about these three gunas. Let us know what these three gunas are and how these are correlated with well-being. It says that those who follow Sat go upwards, the Rajas remain in the middle and Tamsik who follow the course of the lower gunas go downwards. So, these three gunas are Sat is the best one 
Rajsik middle one and tam, uh, Tamsik is highly connected with anxiety, depression etc. The Bhagavad Gita suggests that fruit of good action is sattvic and pure, the fruit of rajas is uh, uh, pain and fruit of tamas is ignorance. Let us know what these three gunas are so that we can connect them with well-being. Let us know gunas, their characteristics, state of mind we would have as per this particular guna and then which activities we have during this period. And you know Indian uh, religious literature giving very much importance to food and they are saying that what kind of food we are eating, it is connected with our gunas. So, food related to particular guna. If we talk about the progress, then uh, the style is if you have tamsik style, then you should strive for or try to get rajsik. If you have rajsik style, then you try to do sattvic. And if you are, you have high level on sattvic, then nirgunas. I will discuss further this point. So, first let us know Sattva, Rajas and Tamas. Sattva, yogi achieves by reducing Rajas and Tamas and thus makes liberation possible. Then what kind of state we would have in our mind during the Sattvic style? Sattva is a state of harmony, balance, joy and intelligence. So, during Sattvic mode we have harmony, balance, joy in our mind what kind of activities we have during this period, enjoy activities and environments that produce joy and positive thoughts. And for food related to sattvic style or sattvic personality style, whole grains and pulses and fresh food and vegetables. Second guna is rajas. Rajas is of attraction, longing and attachment and strong binds us to the fruit of our work. During this state, we have high level of energy action, change and movement and activities over exercising, over work, loud music, excessive thinking and consuming excessive material goods. So, during this period we rely more on external locus of control or external motivation rather internal one and uh, food we like fried foods, spicy food and stimulants are connected with Rajsik style. Tamasik gunas, tamas manifests from ignorance and dilutes all beings from other spiritual truths. And during this process, our state of mind is darkness, inertia, inactivity, uh, materiality. And during this period, we are sluggish, oversleepy, overeating, inactivity, passivity, fearful situation, etc. And food connected with this style is heavy meats and uh, foods that are spoiled, chemically treated, processed or refined foods. So, if we just try to find out what kind of food we are uh, eating and what kind of food we are preferring and uh, as per these foods, what kind of gunas we could have in our life. So, if we compare these three gunas, I think sattvic guna is the best one and we want to get or we strive to get sattvic uh, living style. Practicing yoga and leading a yogic lifestyle that is strongly connected with sattva guna and it cultivates sattvic style. Yogi's goal is to cultivate sattva and to be unattached to both the good and the bad, the positive and negative qualities of all lives. So, when we are in sattvic mode, we are not extremely in positivity or in negativity or in good or in bad, we are more balanced. I will discuss this point a little bit more in later slides. All the gunas create attachment and thus bind oneself to the ego. When one rises above the three gunas, that originate in the body is and we attain enlightenment. Uh, Krishna urges Arjuna to go beyond all gunas, so nirgunas. It means the style is or our uh, way of getting samadhi or moksha is you know first uh, tamasik to struggle for rajasik, rajasik to sattvic and if you have quite high level of on sattvic mode then or sattvic gunas then for getting enlightenment or samadhi or moksha, then one should be nirgunas and that is ultimate uh, achievement 
or can say self actualization in terms of can say in Hinduism. So, human nature and behavior is as much determined by the three gunas sattvic, rajasic, tamasic as the phenomenal universe. It means we can study someone's personality as per these three gunas across the board in universal wherever we want to do. For example, sattvic, rajasic, tamasic personality traits can be assessed in USA, in uh, you know in European countries, in Asian cultures. So, it is not culture specific phenomena where we can say we can test a sattva rajas tamas of Indian people only or only Asian people, but anywhere in any situation the, these three gunas can give us some information about someone's personality type. This association between the three gunas and well-being dimensions, at the end I will discuss number of studies in which even we have uh, studied Sattva Rajas Tamas in three cultures in USA, in Czech Republic and in Indian setting and we compared them as cross-cultural research as well as how Sattva Rajas and Tamas are correlated with well-being dimensions. And we observed that no doubt sattvic style or sattva guna is positively correlated with all positive dimensions of well-being. Tamas was mainly negatively correlated with most of the well-being indicators. On the other hand, rajasik was middle one, was correlated with some of them negatively, but with not all. And sometime we observed that it was not correlated with the, the certain dimensions of well-being. So, knowing gunas and how it is connected with well-being was very important for us and that is why I selected three gunas uh, when we are defining happiness and uh, well-being. Third concept which could be borrowed from Indian religious spiritual literature is anasakti or asakti. According to the Bhagavad Gita, one sequence of mental events is that attachment lead to desire, desire lead to anger, anger lead to mindlessness and mindlessness lead to loss of memory and loss of memory lead to loss of life. So, if we go with this attachment style, it means it is killing our happiness, it is killing our life. On the other hand, another just opposite term is anasakt and positive psychologists have borrowed this term and we are trying to connect it with how it is correlated uh, positively with well-being. So, broadly this term is asakti, anasakti, asakti when we are attached with various things in our life and when we are not able to due to attachment we have desire and if we are not able to fulfill those desires then they create anger, mindlessness, loss of memory, loss of life etc. On the other hand when we are anasakt then we are highly connected with well-being and uh, then we do not have any you know uh, desire, anger etc. Et and uh, there are some studies at the end I will discuss about those studies also in which they observed that yogis have higher level of uh, anasakti as well as anasakti and its dimensions which you know in recent literature we have revealed they are positively correlated with well-being and its dimensions. Fourth concept can be borrowed here is a uh, natural desires of all human beings is to be happy at every stage and in every aspects of our life. And this has been highlighted in our culture, in our prayers, in our uh, you know day to day life like in greetings, during greetings and uh, we are quite close to address happiness in our life. So, for example, Sarve Bhavantu Sukhina. So, we pray let all people be happy. So, that is why happiness is very important for us and it is highest ideal of human life. Sukh Savrup we count and in Hindu system of medicine we describe the concept of Sukh Savrup, happy life that is required here. When we talk about the greetings which we get from our elders and uh, generally they say you know khush raho or be happy. So, again we promote or we give lots of importance to happiness. So, that is why our culture is promoting happiness and that is very important for us. Another uh, aspect which I have borrowed here is swastika. 
it stands for universal welfare. And on various occasions actually we draw this swastika in our culture. Uh, swasti means well-being of one and all and ka means symbol. So, thus swastika indicates happiness, safety, fertility and prosperity. The four corners of the swastika represents four pusharth aims of life namely dharm, arth, kam and moksha and it perfectly symmetrically shaped indicate balanced also represent our four stages. In Indian literature or in Indian religious spiritual literature we find four stages of our life that is Brahmacharya, Grihasthashram, uh, Vanaprastha Vana and then Sanyas and it is reflecting here. Life connects these four corners together. So, then we say these all are highly connected with each other or highly correlated or associated with each other. So, connections are there. On the other hand in mantras, if you just take any mantra, you will find that it is you know discussing happiness, happiness of uh, oneself, happiness of others, or environmental factors and uh, all other living beings. So, for example, Sarve Bhavantu Sukhina mantras uh, may all be happy, may all be free from diseases, may all perceive good and may not suffer from uh, sorrow. So, such kind of prayers we have, Gayatri mantra you know quite famous again well being focused this mantra is. So, that is why in Indian culture or in Indian religious spiritual literature this is quite prominent to have uh, happiness. Let us touch another model also that is Ayurvedic therapy. Ayurvedic therapy or Ayurvedic model it is mainly ba based on balance and imbalance in our body. Imbalance when we have imbalance then we may have some humors like vat, pit or cough and our ultimate goal is to restore this equilibrium or the balance and when we are balanced then we are happy and healthy and body and mind are highly connected. In fact, we cannot study them as an independent entities. These two are connected with each other and influencing each other very much. Ayurveda means the knowledge of life and doshas means dysfunctions or abnormal behavior a deviation from the perfect balance. So, when we have uh, imbalancing and that is why vat, pit and cuff these problems we have and our ultimate goal through Ayurvedic medicine is to get balance again and if we get this balance then we have perfect life. Ayurvedic medicines try to restore the balance caused from the doshas and according to Ayurveda the highest virtue is balance. So, Ayurvedic model is based on the unique balance of vat, pit and cuff that determines a person's constitution, body type and mental and emotional strengths and weaknesses. So, here connections between body type, mental and emotional strengths and weaknesses are being highlighted. Two more terms have been borrowed from our religious spiritual literature which are highly connected with the western models to some extent and define happiness in their own way. These two terms are prayas and sreyas. Indian traditions also talks about well-being as prayas sreyas. Prayas refers to material and social level of reality, roughly correspondence to hedonic perspective, whereas sreyas refer to the transcendental level of reality, correspondence to eudonomia perspective. So, to some extent prayers focus more on social level of reality which is connected with subjective well-being to some extent and stress connected with the psychological well-being to some extent and it focus more on transcendental level of reality. So, ancient as well as modern sages have pointed out that Shreyas is what matters ultimately. So, again like uh, western scholars who have given more importance to uh, psychological well-being or on eudonomic perspective compared to uh, hedonic or subjective well-being. These scholars also or sages also gave more importance to the uh, Shreyas style.
Indian psychology has much to offer in terms of self growth independent of any specific religious tradition. However, most of these uh, happenings or these messages have been borrowed from religious spiritual literature only. One of its major agenda is how to liberate human beings from the bondage of ignorance, suffering and to create social order of harmony, peace and personal growth. So, here actually focus is in inner direction more and our objective is to get liberation, mocks and how we can have harmony, peace, personal growth within ourselves. So, I think this point will be very clear to you. We are actually addressing more world within when we are talking about happiness in Indian context. Next concept which is borrowed here is spiritual dimension of human existence. In India, this is very important for us. This has led to the search for ultimate uh, happiness within rather than without. Hence, the pursuit of happiness in material things and in social world is considered secondary. But primary focus is world within or within our life or within our uh, mind we can say what kind of spiritual level or dimension we have. And then they are saying that self-realization, atam saksatkar that is very important and this is it is contemporary concerns of positive psychology. The Indian tradition particularly the view stressed in the Upanishad puts emphasis on transcendenting all dualities positive and negative to reach ultimate awareness. So, they are saying that for self-realization, for Atam Saksatkar, we have to resolve all dualities in our life, not extremely positive, not extremely negative, not extremely good, not extremely bad. So, when we learn to have balanced life or balanced way of live or middle path to some extent we can say, then that is promote to happiness. There are some Asian perspectives also and in modern psychology, modern positive psychology, these perspectives are also highlighted a lot. And now even European western scholars are considering these factors to define happiness. Let us understand these two, three terms to define happiness. First is the harmony. A harmony presupposes the existence of different things and implies a certain favorable relationship among them. And uh, Antonella and her associates found that individuals consider psychological balance and harmony as being important for their happiness. So, I will discuss about this research in which we had some questions in which we had uh, 12 countries, 13 data set and we uh, had uh, data from uh, North India as well as from South India and in this research we observed that there are some lay definitions and when we are talking about these lay definitions or how people are defining happiness, then we are crossing the boundaries and we are getting some more definitions and uh, having broader list or having more terms in our basket of happiness to define happiness. Then she observed balance and harmony also very important for us. In Chinese culture, they give more importance to benevolence and uh, helping others we can say compassion and giving more importance to others happiness to some extent we can say. Benevolence is defining as controlling one's desires to conform to the decorum valued by society. And in this culture, they are saying that this is important to fulfilling one's desires. So, for fulfilling our desires, having high level of benevolence is very important as per this culture. And now, scholars are taking into account this perspective. Internal state of equilibrium or balance and harmony is also highlighted in uh, Asian cultures. When there are no steering of pleasure, anger, sorrow or joy, the mind may be said to be in the state of equilibrium or balance. So, when we do not have any agitating thoughts like uh, pleasure, anger, sorrow, joy, then we are like 
calm and quiet and you know peaceful mind we have and that balance is actually highlighted as harmony or internal state of balance in which we feel or we experience within our self happiness. Peace of mind refers to the experience of internal peace and harmony that is also taken into account by some scholars. Experience of internal peace includes affective states such as being peaceful, calm and quiet. Internal harmony captures the state of mind that include balance and harmony. So, these are certain terms or certain ways of defining happiness in which harmony, mental peace, balance and peace of mind or inner harmony are important terms or that way actually inner world is highlighted more than the external world to get happiness. So, these are the ways to define happiness in psychology. I think you are well equipped now with various models of happiness in which we have highlighted on subjective well-being, on psychological well-being, on social well-being and then certain models in which we combine these unique modules and highlighted new models like mental health continuum, PERMA model and then I think various borrowed ideas from Indian psychology which are defining to some extent and correlated with the happiness we discussed and that is uh, these are Indian perspectives and then Asian perspective in which we highlighted inner harmony, peace of mind etcetera. This topic will be continue in next classes. Thank you.